This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Let's press pause on the news cycle for just a minute and dig into some stories that deserve a little more attention. America's opioid crisis fell out of the headlines, but it's been quietly getting worse throughout the pandemic. We've got more on why. Plus, some military families are living without enough to eat. How is that possible and what can be done to help solve it? But first, we're following up on Newsy's own reporting on a growing international crisis. This past spring, our visual investigation series, Newsy Bellingcat, partnered with the BBC to reveal exclusive details of a civilian massacre in Ethiopia. That's where a conflict between the Ethiopian government and rebels in the country's Tigray region has often left civilians in the crossfire or even as intentional targets. Videos of a mass killing of unarmed civilians surfaced online early this year, but the culprits and the location of the attack were unknown until Newsy and our partners used open source reporting to identify nearby landscapes, as well as some identifying features on uniforms. The reporting pointed to one likely culprit, Ethiopia's military. The very next day after we broke the story this spring, foreign secretaries for the G7 nations, including the US and its allies, released a joint statement condemning the killing of Tigray civilians and calling for accountability. But this conflict in Eastern Africa is far from over. In fact, in many ways, it's gotten worse, spreading to neighboring regions in Ethiopia. And the United Nations says over 7 million people in the Tigray area are now in need of emergency aid. Coletta Wajoli reports. <laughs> Nobit Sahile Kidei and her seven-year-old son are able to eat at least two meals a day with these food rations from the UN World Food Program. This internally displaced camp in Amhara in the northern region of Ethiopia is what they call home for now. She says they came here from a village over 200 miles away to escape the fighting and they had no time to prepare for the journey. We were on foot and we had to cross a river that could have drowned us, but some people helped us to cross. We had children with us. It was very challenging. Some people were injured during our escape and we had to hide in villages along the way. The United Nations estimates that since November last year, the conflict has forced over 7 million people in Ethiopia's northern region, a region which shares borders with Sudan and Eritrea, to depend on emergency assistance. The UN says there is a de facto blockade of aid into the region. It's absolutely vital that we're able to reach all of the communities where people are in need of food assistance before we have a humanitarian catastrophe on our hands. The conflict has threatened to stain the image of Ethiopia's Nobel Peace Prize winning Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who came into power in April 2018 as a transitional leader. Abiy Ahmed Ali. In July, he was officially elected to office in controversial polls held in the midst of the conflict and the humanitarian crisis. But last November, long rising tensions between the federal government and the leadership of the Northern Tigray region exploded into military confrontation. A confrontation that has left millions of people struggling to find food, medicine, fuel and shelter. Now I have no job because we came from that area to this. We don't, we don't have work. My family, my mother, father, and other families, they migrate to Sudan. If there is no peace, there is no dialogue. If there is no peace, there is no communication. So we need peace. The deteriorating humanitarian crisis from the protracted conflict has attracted international concern. The United States, the largest single donor to Ethiopia, has sanctioned the country twice in a bid to push for an end to the conflict. Abiy Ahmed's government insists that the international community has misunderstood its intentions. While cooperation and concern from our friends is welcome, we underline the need to employ constructive approach, cultivate trust and create understanding. Attempts to extend support or even opine on an internal issue of a state requires full understanding about the complexity of the problem. The Ethiopian government has accused some humanitarian agencies of aiding the rebels. It has expelled seven United Nations officials. The United Nations has asked Ethiopia to reverse this decision, warning that it will affect the humanitarian operation. And the United States has asked Ethiopia to let the UN officials back in. And it has warned it will otherwise take what it calls decisive actions. Meanwhile, 
the malnutrition rate in Tigray is climbing, and deaths from starvation have been reported. Ethiopia has said it will not negotiate with terrorists, but will work with the African Union to find peace through an Ethiopian-led national dialogue. And caught in the middle of a political crisis, millions of people like Nobit, more concerned about peace than politics, waiting for the day when it is safe to return home. Koleta Wanjohi for Newsy, Addis Ababa. Many thanks to Coletta for that reporting. This is the kind of story that's not going anywhere and definitely one we'll keep putting in the spotlight. Next up, questions of accountability for a quiet crisis playing out right here in the U.S. Stick with us. Let's start with how the Sacklers got here. I'm talking about the bankruptcy settlement for Purdue Pharma, owned by the Sackler family. A judge ruled that in addition to a fine of $4.5 billion, the Sackler family would be granted complete immunity from opioid lawsuits in the future. There's a lot to unpack about what that actually means. The family is notoriously private and protective of their image. But even if you're not sure who they are, you may have at least seen their name. The family is one of the wealthiest in the world, and they are famous patrons of the arts. Their names could be found in galleries like the Smithsonian, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Guggenheim. Here's what's most relevant. The Sackler family ran the now bankrupt pharmaceutical company, Purdue, famous for its OxyContin medication. The family made much of their fortune in selling OxyContin, an opioid painkiller in the same chemical family as heroin. You can see their sales goals skyrocketing over this time. Purdue became infamous for aggressively distributing the drug, which many cite as one of the major factors that led to the opioid epidemic we still face today. After tens of thousands of Americans died from those opioids, one question still remains. Who can we actually hold responsible for this? In 2004, it was the doctors in the hot seat. Prosecutors brought criminal charges against physicians for prescribing massive amounts of OxyContin. Purdue became nervous for its blockbuster drug and donated to think tanks with well-placed experts who published media pieces saying law enforcement was overzealous. The doctors were just doing their jobs. In 2007, it was the Purdue executives. The company pled guilty to the criminal misdemeanor of misbranding, in other words, downplaying the risks of OxyContin addiction and failing to warn the doctors they sold to. Court documents from 2007 obtained by ProPublica show Purdue's head of sales telling the family, we are well aware of the view held by many physicians that oxycodone, the active ingredient in OxyContin, is weaker than morphine. I do not plan to do anything about that. Richard Sackler said, I agree with you. The company paid a fine of $600 million and three executives paid individual fines totaling $34.5 million. Over the next decade, it was the pill mills. States began cracking down on pain clinics, selling doses of the drug, and prescriptions became scarce. The damage was done though. This led to cheaper opioids like heroin and fentanyl only growing in popularity. And there was an explosion in public demands for holding the Sacklers accountable, not just Purdue. A tsunami of lawsuits started coming in and the Sackler name was removed from the institutions they once donated to. One heated email conversation in the family obtained by US attorneys shows David Sackler asking, what do you think is going on in all of these courtrooms right now? We're rich for how long? Until which suits get through to the family? By the time Purdue had filed for bankruptcy in 2019, it was being sued by nearly every state in the country and thousands of other claimants. And yet holding the Sacklers accountable themselves had been next to impossible. The bankruptcy agreement protects the family from all opioid related civil charges. And prosecutors have said realistically, criminal charges could be difficult to prove. The government has yet to press a single criminal charge against the Sacklers. Bankruptcy settlements can give a company protection from lawsuits since the company works to restructure its debts. What's odd about this ruling is that this protection was given to the individual owners, not the company. The owners haven't even declared bankruptcy. So who will face accountability for the opioid epidemic? The one still killing over 60,000 people a year. This case has led some members of Congress to introduce a bill, the Sackler Act, to prevent bad actors from evading responsibility through bankruptcy proceedings. 
While that might prevent future cases like this, it still leaves us without a clear guilty party here in the eyes of the court. The Sackler family remains one of the richest in the world, and they've never been charged and continue to deny responsibility for the epidemic. Of course, many of the families impacted by the epidemic do not feel like justice has been fully served. On the other hand, supporters of the settlement argue funding for healthcare and drug treatment is ultimately better than dragging out the expensive court cases. They see this as the best outcome possible in the shortest amount of time. After all, this epidemic has been ongoing and getting worse during the pandemic. Newsy Stephanie Liebergen tells us more. We're in the midst of a crisis and we're very concerned about it. America's opioid crisis started long before 2020, but COVID-19 exacerbated the problem. The pandemic had a big impact because as you know, people were closed, institutions were closed or working remotely or working at you know, 20, 50, 30% of their capacity. CDC data shows over 93,000 people died of a drug overdose in 2020, the highest yearly total on record. And a majority of those deaths involved opioids. One of the states hit the hardest was Vermont, and that's where Jesse Bunch works as the executive director of the Turning Point Center in Chittenden County, a peer recovery organization in Burlington. People are, are waiting a long time for mental health counseling. We're seeing an increase not only in overdoses, but in individuals going to the emergency departments in the state. And, um, you know, it's, it's a situation where the problem has gotten bigger and the resources have, um, have declined. And, and that's what we're struggling with. Before the pandemic, opioid deaths in Vermont actually had been trending down, but the state saw a nearly 40% increase in fatal drug overdoses in 2020, most of them involving opioids. And some of the worst months coincided with the early days of the pandemic and stay-at-home orders. And that's left a lot of people um, on the streets and struggling and uh, not able to get into not able to get into help data from the first five months of 2021 shows opioid related deaths in vermont have continued to rise we're seeing people coming in here every day really struggling with substance use disorder and mental health issues and we're trying to get them into the services that they need but we're finding that often those services simply are not yet available again. State officials recognize the need to do more. In June, they launched the No OD campaign aimed at helping people make safer choices and increasing awareness about opioid overdose symptoms. Stephanie Liebergen, Newsy, Washington. Here to talk with us a little bit more about that story is Newsy's Stephanie Liebergen, new friend of ITL. Stephanie, we talked a little bit about oxycodone earlier, uh, but what are some of the other drugs that have been perpetuating this crisis? The CDC kind of tracks this in three different waves that have all led to the opioid crisis that we're dealing today. And they really point it back, starting back in about 1999 with a prescription drug overdose issue. Now that continued for a little over a decade. And it wasn't until 2010 that the CDC had what they call the second wave. And that was when heroin overdoses really started to rise. Then about three years later, that's when you had the synthetic opioids really coming into play. That's where you're talking about your uh, fentanyl, one that we hear a lot about that's incredibly dangerous. Just a small amount of fentanyl can be deadly and drug dealers will you know, cut fentanyl into cocaine or meth or some other drug. So these drug users are not even necessarily aware that they're taking some Something as dangerous as fentanyl where just a small amount could kill them and all of those things combined have really brought us to the crisis as we're dealing with it today and we understand that this crisis has you know even gotten worse during the pandemic I mean one of the things that we've learned through your reporting and through additional reporting is that a lot of those in-person resources uh, had to be cut back during the pandemic um, and rerouted to virtual resources um, what are some of the ways that folks have been trying to address this epidemic uh, during the pandemic? Well, you're absolutely right. Services took, in-person services especially, took a big hit during the pandemic. Now, Vermont, the state that I was focusing on, um, actually started a statewide resource. They call it Vermont Help Link. They launched that in March of 2020, so just as the pandemic was getting underway, really a, a free confidential resource with a bunch of information about recovery services or you know effort, harm reduction efforts. Um, Vermont has a number of programs that they're doing in their state to try to combat the 
opioid crisis that are also happening across the country. So there are 42 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, that all have syringe exchange programs that are, you know, allow, you know, drug users to switch out those syringes to stay safer in that manner. And that's something that Vermont's really focused on is reducing that harm. So that's those safe, you know, syringe exchange programs. Also, even just an awareness and education campaign, honestly encouraging people if they're going to use drugs, don't do it alone. Have someone else with you. So that way you have someone with you who would maybe recognize the symptoms of an overdose and be able to help with something like naloxone if needed. And now that's another thing Vermont's doing and across the country. States are trying to make access to Narcan that naloxone, um, trying to make access to that much, much easier. There are even, you know, efforts to put boxes like we have fire extinguishers and defibrillators that'll just be, you know, in a box on the wall and, you know, buildings and public places. They're trying to do that same thing with naloxone to make it easy for people to access, you know, to not keep it behind a pharmacy desk and, you know, requiring a prescription. Yeah. So even though those in-person resources had to be scaled back, there's still a number of ways that folks have been trying to address this crisis, as we've learned from your reporting. Stephanie Liebregen, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to do it again sometime. When you're back, we're going to take a closer look at how some Native tribes are working to treat addiction through less conventional methods. What do you think the future looks like? From Newsy, renowned journalists and filmmakers, comes a celebration of storytelling. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? When the suspect admits to it, I'm I mean, not going to argue the, the law with you. <sighs> New features every week. Newsy Docs presents Sunday nights at 9, 8 central, only on Newsy. Earlier in the show, we talked a bit about the opioid epidemic, something that's still killing tens of thousands of people each year. Addiction and substance abuse have been particularly worrying during the pandemic. Substance abuse centers have had to pivot to virtual resources, binge drinking has increased, and so has opioid-related overdoses. For some, conventional forms of treatment are enough, but some native tribes are prescribing natural remedies to treat addiction and connect those suffering with their community. Newsy's Bianca Faschini has more. Marty Ream struggled with addiction for years. It started with alcohol and ended with meth, leading to a dangerous encounter that almost ended his life. And in 2006, I got stabbed six times in Billings um, over drugs. Got stabbed in the leg, back of the head. Missed my lung here, missed my lung here, tore my earlobe off here with whatever that person was stabbing me with. I still don't know to this day what he stabbed me with, but uh, almost died. He sought professional help, but ultimately his community on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation helped him sustain sobriety through a method that experts call natural recovery. I took some tools from mm -hmm. that traditional treatment, um, formal treatment facility, but I took a lot more from being right here with our people. Conventional treatment ranges from in and outpatient care to sober living homes and AA meetings. In natural recovery, people rely more on support through cultural traditions. Reem says his naming ceremony helped him form a sense of identity, self-esteem, and connection to his tribe. Our cultural belief is that when you have your native name, you're able to identify with your ancestors on the other side. Other Indian ceremonies like sweat and sundance establish communal support networks for people recovering from addiction, often with others that are also in recovery or were touched by addiction in another way. All of these traditions helped Reem gain an understanding of his culture that he wasn't taught growing up. I didn't know any of that because our family wasn't traditional because of boarding school, because of these horrific events that changed the landscape for our people still to this day. Up until the late 20th century, Indian children were forcibly sent to boarding schools to, quote, civilize them into European-American culture. Physical and mental abuse was frequent. Reem's father is a boarding school survivor and, like many other survivors, was left traumatized. That trauma has had a long-lasting impact, one that experts say needs to be addressed to combat the addiction crisis plaguing Indian country today. 
without really, really coming to terms and identifying what had happened and acknowledging it, then we'll never get that peace. The latest statistics on drug use in and near Indian reservations are daunting, particularly among teenagers. But members of the Fort Peck tribes maintain a positive outlook. People on the reservation are hopeful that natural recovery can open paths to sobriety for those that didn't find success in conventional treatment alone. But they also acknowledge that there are plenty of challenges ahead, especially when it comes to resources. While the benefits of natural recovery are being embraced as an alternative, it was partially born out of the delay in funding for formal treatment. Usually when we get the funding, we're behind the curve on what the new issue is. But Judge Forstar has seen success after introducing elements of natural recovery to people in court for drug-related issues. Addiction experts say it demonstrates there's still much more to learn about recovery among Indian tribes and every other demographic. People believe that if you have a serious addiction problem that you have to go to inpatient treatment, that that's like rehab is the only way. And research doesn't really support that. The learning curve has been steep, but the Fort Peck tribes say the reservation's cultural revitalization has left them better prepared to deal with addiction. And they look at the restoration of the buffalo, which once faced extinction, as a symbol of strength and resilience. Do you feel hopeful about moving forward and your community being able to recover from all of the trauma that there has been and has made it so difficult for people? I'm hopeful because I see a change in my girls because I broke the cycle sooner than my dad. And so my hope is, is now that I live this good life, that my daughters marry good men and that they raise good children and that they raise them in beliefs that are good. And that's how you break this cycle. Bianca Fischini, Newsy, Fort Peck. We're turning our attention to the ongoing fight against COVID-19 and how some rural hospitals have been dealing with a surge of new cases. The president signed executive orders requiring most federal workers and contractors to get a vaccine as part of a larger push to get most people the COVID-19 shots. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And it's caused by the fact that despite America having unprecedented and successful vaccination program, despite the fact that for almost five months, free vaccines have been available in 80,000 different locations we still have nearly 80 million Americans who have failed to get the shot. This comes as another spike slams parts of the country with the lowest vaccination rates. Rural hospitals have been especially overwhelmed with COVID patients throughout the pandemic. Cases and hospitalizations have been much higher in these areas compared to urban communities. Some hospitals have had to expand their ICUs to handle the increase of people. National reporter Chloe Nordquist is going back to a Missouri hospital that was one of the first in the country to see a surge in Delta cases. PPE safety protocols, busy units, and intubation kits on standby. I am looking to bring down our auction some more. This hospital in Springfield, Missouri, is dealing with a high number of COVID-19 cases. It looks like a war zone. One of our physicians took a picture we had two patients side by side coding simultaneously. There are 15 staff around them. Just a few weeks ago, Cox Health held more than 187 COVID patients, the highest number yet. And while that number is going down, all eyes were on Missouri as it became a hotbed for Delta cases. Being kind of a rural epicenter, we had that duty to communicate back to the rest of the country what we, what we were seeing. Steve Edwards is the president of Cox Health. You saw a spike after the holidays and then you were able to close your large COVID unit around April time frame. Yeah. Um, what do things look like now? It began to rapidly accelerate. We saw the data show that the Delta variant had gone from maybe 10% to 100%, virtually 100% of our patients. So we then um, hit a peak of 187 patients, which exceeded our uh, winter peak. It's a trend the National Rural Health Association is seeing everywhere. Right now, COVID cases, hospitalizations, and mortality per population are all trending much higher in rural communities than in urban communities. 
Back at the beginning of the pandemic, Cox Health opened this open ward style COVID ICU, finished in just two weeks to help treat COVID patients. These photos they provided show the room filled with people around the last holiday season. It's organized chaos. And this is what the room looked like in April when they were able to shut the unit down. Now Cox Health is sharing these photos from July showing the unit busy once again. We were not allowed in while we were there due to safety reasons. I remember trying to look up at the windows and count the days and it's kind of surreal because everybody was masked and gloved and kind of double masked with all their PPE and stuff and then they'd have these little hats on with lights on top. Um, they they kind of looked like aliens or Martians or something, and they'd just be running around all times of the, the day and night. Kim McCulley Mobley lives 40 minutes southwest of the hospital in the town of Aurora. She was in this exact unit during her fight with COVID earlier this year on a ventilator for eight days. It was pretty critical. I think my oxygen levels were pretty low and my son kept asking me to fight. She spent three weeks in the hospital and months getting back to normal. Her son documenting her journey on social media. Thank you for being relentless and never giving up on me. Kim says she's almost fully recovered. She's grateful, recently writing a letter to her son. I am ready for more adventures. You are my hero, always. Sometimes the human spirit is extremely and wonderfully resilient, and sometimes it's really fragile. You know, I don't, I don't know why I'm still here, except maybe my work wasn't finished yet. That's what I'm hoping. Maybe I get to finish some more things. It's for people like Kim that healthcare workers continue to fight, a battle that Steve says is not over. I think the challenge for our staff is we're seeing our numbers ease, but all around us, in the regions around us, hospitals are full. We have this kind of civic duty, we think, a moral obligation to try to take care of other regions because they helped us. I really still think there are unsung heroes and I had wonderful care and they, they really get my respect. I'm Chloe Nordquist reporting. Next up, U.S. military families going without the food they need. How does something like that happen in one of the world's wealthiest countries? And what can be done to fix it? What if the news was different and covered more than one side of the story? Justice wasn't served. So you can make up your own mind. I love you so much. Introducing the new point of view, yours, Newsy. Watch free 24 hour news. The pandemic has made a lot of social and economic problems even worse. And one of those is food insecurity, including among military families. And now US troops have left Afghanistan after spending more than $2 trillion over the course of 20 years. So with all that money spent on the military, where's the funding for military families? And why is this problem of food insecurity so common? Your parents may have told you when you were a kid, there's people starving in insert developing or lower income country here to get you to eat your dinner so it didn't go to waste. The sad reality is there's people starving right here at home. Feeding America reports that overall, 42 million Americans are currently food insecure. That includes roughly 13 million children. Syracuse University research shows that before COVID, one in seven military families were food insecure, but now that number could be as high as one in three. There are a few factors playing into this. That includes low wages for lower ranked military members and high rates of unemployment among military spouses. Not surprising when you consider that that lifestyle involves frequent moves, expensive childcare, and having a partner who might have a pretty unpredictable schedule. Military spouses like Erica Tebbins know the struggle of finding work all too well. While her husband was active duty Navy, they moved to a new state where she had to get a new license to continue working as a teacher, which proved complicated. Here's what she told us. It didn't really seem worth it because I also would have had to pay for our son to be in daycare or have some sort of childcare while I was in school. It's really easy for America to exploit enlisted service members because we don't have a lot of other options for people if they want affordable education if they want affordable health care, 
if they want, you know, uh, to get out of a like a dire financial situation. According to the Military Times, the most junior enlisted troops earn a base pay of about $21,000 per year, plus a possible housing allowance depending on their status. Military families are also often based in cities with a high cost of living, and a soldier's salary isn't always enough. The government offers food assistance programs like SNAP, but for service members who receive a housing allowance from the military, they are ineligible for the program. You also have to consider military culture, which makes some service members reluctant to ask for help. The whole like kind of brand around the military of just like being tough and having your sh together kind of, and being like a, a warrior, uh, it can feel really shameful to be like, oh yeah, I don't know, you know, we're having to take out payday loans or put groceries on the credit card and um, and things like that. It's just, it's, it's really hard to want to be honest about that. Still, many military families rely on food banks for their meals. The Armed Services YMCA, which has food banks on military bases across the country, says some of their locations have gone through serving 400 families a month to 400 families a week since the pandemic started. Erica's family didn't qualify for SNAP when they applied, but qualified for WIC, which is food assistance specifically for pregnant women, new mothers, and infants and children up to five while she was pregnant and through her son's first year of life. Of course, more food assistance through programs like that would help, but the problems these military families face run deeper than just that. They would have a better, safer, stronger military if thousands of their service members were not also stressed about how their loved ones at home were gonna pay the bills and put food on the table. In May, a bipartisan bill was introduced called the Military Hunger Prevention Act, which supports creating a basic needs allowance to provide food for military families. That bill was put forward by Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth and Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn. We spoke with Senator Blackburn about her proposal and whether it could really make a difference for military families struggling to put food on the table. As a as a way to kind of lay the foundation here, how did Judah and Senator Duckworth come to um, introduce the Military Hunger Prevention Act? As we have worked on addressing some of the issues with substandard housing for our military families, what we became aware of was that there was also this issue that they had they were cut out of benefits that they may need. So if they're in a substandard house and then they really need these benefits, uh, but the substandard house that they're wrestling with is keeping them from getting additional benefits that they need for their children, such as free lunch, such as um, food assistance programs. So we decided we would do something about it and we are. I'm curious to know, because these are lower earning uh, military personnel, um, is the bigger issue the lack of access to food assistance or uh, or maybe, you know, not giving our military personnel um, a, a higher salary or a salary to uh, a living wage, so to speak? When you look at hazard pay, uh, of course, that is a good thing. But during these times of redeployment, and the incredible number of deployments and the lack of dwell time, we just need to realize this is a very tedious and dangerous job and they should be co uh, compensated appropriately for what they are enduring every day. The way the formulary is positioned is the flaw and having this in the NDAA is a way to fix that flaw. Addressing some of these issues with on-base housing and substandard housing, that was a way to fix that flaw and that problem in the system. Addressing licensure so that spouses who are licensed in so many different uh, professions can take that licensure across state lines, whether it is an accountant, or an aesthetician, 
uh, whether it is a nurse or a teacher, and that would allow them to immediately be able to go to work. This is all part of addressing barriers that hinder the work of the military family, and we should be showing our gratitude to them for their service. How exactly does the Military Hunger Prevention Act address the underreporting on, on this issue? When you remove that formulary, uh, remove this provision in the formulary, what you will do is allow them to say, this is where I fall in that line, thereby I can qualify. Right now, the way the formulary exists, that is a barrier in and of itself to people saying, I need additional help because they'll turn to family or friends to help them bridge this gap. And we want them to be able to work through this in the system and open that door of opportunity for more of our military families. What's next for the Military Hunger Prevention Act? It is moving through with the NDAA and we will see that process resume when we head back into session in September. When you're back, We'll take you out west where researchers are looking into a little understood aspect of wildfire damage. Since the start of the year, there have been more than 40,000 wildfires compared to 35,000 last year. About 4 million acres have burned so far, and nearly all of the land out west is experiencing moderate or severe drought. Things are so bad that the National Interagency Fire Center said in July that most firefighting resources were committed to fighting woodland fires across the country, which is the earliest they've made that declaration in a decade. National reporter Maya Rodriguez tells us that researchers are now looking into one aspect of these wildfires that may be responsible for much of that damage. The lengthening wildfire season in the U.S. Straining resources and people. It's a glorified camping trip that's costing way too much money. <laughs> And, and I just want to go home. About 4.5 million homes in the U.S. are considered at high or extreme risk for wildfire damage. This is a problem that's increasing exponentially. Now researchers are starting to look into what may be one of the most destructive, but poorly understood, parts of a wildfire. Like think of a charcoal glowing in your charcoal pit, but flying through the air where it can now start other fires. Professor Peter Sunderland is with the Department of Fire Protection Engineering at the University of Maryland. And seen in this video they provided is the focus of new wildfire research. They're called firebrands. All the rage now in wildland fire research is these firebrands. We finally understand how fire spreads from tree to tree, grasses spread kind of along in a nice line. And that's well understood. Firebrands are changing the whole game. Different from embers, firebrands are about the size of a quarter. They reach temperatures of more than 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit and jump miles ahead of a wildfire, starting new ones. But little else is known about them. We're realizing now how important these are for fire spread. At the University of Maryland lab, researchers created firebrands inside a wind tunnel and observed them. The firebrands tend to accumulate in one place. And this is when you start to get, to get trouble. As firebrands get increasing amounts of attention from researchers, they're also looking for solutions, particularly what can best protect homes and businesses in vulnerable wildfire areas. And if once the deck catches fire, usually the whole house will be burned. Which is why they are also looking at how firebrands interact with particular materials, like wood, wood composite, and even plastic composites, to see if building codes might need to be changed to better resist firebrands. That's really the objective of the research, is to get into the fire codes. The communities then adopt these codes, and that makes uh, the wildland interface a safer place for everybody. And prevent destruction suffered by so many. Amaya Rodriguez. The prices of fruits, vegetables, and other foods are going up, and as we head into the fall and winter, things like pumpkins and Christmas trees will cost more too. The reason for this, farmers across the U.S. are losing crops because of climate change, and some of them are advocating for the government to invest more in climate change research. 
Natural reporter Joe St. George speaks to farmers and learns more about the new methods they're using to keep as many crops as they can. The bright buzz of summer is slowly dimming. The science of it is fascinating. Terry Jones is here to remind you. They're just starting to turn. Pumpkin season will be here before you know it, and then you've got trees ready to cut. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But Terry, a fifth generation farmer in Connecticut says, OK, this is a great spot. It's not getting ahead of ourselves to talk about the climate and how farmers from coast to coast are battling changes. In your 74 years, how has the climate changed? Well, it's more erratic. Terry says it's not that it's hot all the time. It's just when it's warm, it stays warmer longer. When it rains, it keeps raining. Extreme cold is as devastating to the Jones family farm as a drought. He lost 500 Christmas trees last year because of unseasonably cold temperatures. If it had dropped a couple degrees more, instead of having 500 trees, we might have had 5,000 that got damaged. Terry says people often forget when the weather gets rough, it's more than just buildings that get damaged. Crops do too, and that has the potential to impact the price of food. For instance, bread prices are expected to go up soon nationwide because wheat fields out west have been lost because of a drought. At the consumer level, we have to get used to higher prices. In an effort to prevent the impacts of the next big storm. See those roots? So we'll sequester carbon. Terry is focusing heavily on soil health. He tries to protect the nutrients in his fields by rotating which ones are planted each year. Each newly planted tree gets special compost to help trap in moisture. How he is farming is very different from his ancestors, but he believes the federal government needs to spend more money on understanding how a changing environment is. And they're in there getting the pollen. Impacting America's farms. We have to really focus on what matters. In Washington, spending more money on agriculture climate research and how farms are impacted by a changing climate is part of the massive multi-trillion dollar spending proposal before Congress. Debate on this will intensify in September. In total, Congress could spend $300 billion on various climate change initiatives if what's proposed becomes law. Every year we always say we've never seen this before. But when you visit other farms besides Terry's, you realize a lot of farmers are already changing their ways without Washington. I left out every other row and I planted a cover crop. William Della Camara actually stopped planting some rows reserved for his tomato plants. He did this so the soil wouldn't shift so radically during rainstorms. He also did it to prevent various diseases. The evolving climate, he says, is impacting what insects and pests visit the farm too. Creating more space between plants makes it harder for insects to kill his crops. If this row was here, maybe these tomatoes would have more disease already. Maybe they'd be already be dead. But William isn't one of these farmers who believes Washington doesn't have a role going forward. He says many farmers are not adapting or evolving, growing food as if the weather today was the same as it was 100 years ago. If you were to go ask him right now, why are you doing it like that? He's going to say, because that's the way my father did it. It, it shouldn't, shouldn't be politically charged, but it is. In Shelton, Connecticut, I'm Joe St. George. That's it for Newsies in the Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. But if you made it through the whole show, you probably know that by now. Thanks for sticking with me through the end. I am honored. Since you already made it through this show, why don't you just stick with Newsy and check out what else we have going on?